even in Washington. And so what my intent to do today is talk about a number of things. Uh, this slide kind of uh, helps depict what that's going to be. Um, I need to talk about nematodes um, to some extent. Uh, I want to talk about some of the new tools that we've been using to characterize where nematodes occur in the soil. And once you determine that the, these soil distributions uh, require some new tools in themselves to manage. So we're, I'm going to talk about some new fumigant application equipment that we're utilizing in Florida. I want to talk about soil and how the soil itself affects uh, the movement of nematodes as well as uh, fumigant gases and other uh, nematicidal products. I want to talk about vertical management zones and I want to conclude with a, a few minutes talking about uh, raspberries in, in particular. Uh, I'm an extension nematologist with the University of Florida. 70% of my time is directly involved in contact with growers and my mission, if you will, is to develop uh, management strategies for nematodes of all fruit and vegetable crops that are grown in Florida. And uh, I share this responsibility with one other person. So uh, over the years, uh, I've spent a lot of time in many different cropping systems. And uh, I want to first point out that nematodes are but a single component of a broader, bigger complex of pests. And we really can't think of nematodes exclusively in developing management strategies for nematodes themselves, but have to consider all of the other soil-borne diseases and pests such as weeds in an overall IPM approach because singularity, it, it, it really doesn't work well for growers uh, to attempt to implement a strategy to manage nematodes if you can't simultaneously uh, consider other pests in that uh, program. So as far as nematodes are concerned, I, I like to use this slide, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. They're microscopic roundworms. They live in the soil. Uh, they attack the root systems of plants. The reason why they're problematic is um, what you see here is a species of root knot nematode. The adult gravid female, if you will, is attached to the head of a pin on it. Uh, the larvae from this uh, species is shredded through the needle here. It has an infective stage just like that of lesion nematodes where they infect the root and establish feeding sites in the uh, vascular area of, of the root itself. And the reason why they're such a, a, a huge problem globally is the fact that they're so prolific. Uh, individual females can produce 500 to a couple of thousand eggs apiece. So that population densities ex increase exponentially almost uh, when you allow repeated generations to develop within the crop. Um, all nematodes, plant parasitic nematodes, uh, induce symptoms in the plants in a similar way. And it's the root dysfunction itself that is the uh, cause for the symptoms that you see in the foliar parts of the plant itself. So up in this top left-hand corner, because they interfere with the plant's ability to absorb water and nutrients, one of the, the first symptoms you see is wilting, particularly in late afternoon under very high temperature conditions. The galling that occurs on the plant, as you see in the bottom left here, uh, is another characteristic symptom for this nematode species anyway, and it, and it positively confirms the presence of it. It stunts the plant in the middle one here. Nematodes don't occur uniformly in the field. They occur in patches, which is why uh, it's, it's a patchy distribution that you're looking for in terms of the uh, distribution within the field. And in many cases, they cause a chlorosis or a yellowing in the foliage itself as a result of its inability to, the plant's inability to pick up uh, nutrients in the soil. Now, I'm not, I don't want to spend a lot of time on sampling other than to say that uh, it's really necessary uh, during the course of plant development to determine what the areas of poor growth are that are occurring within a field. And that's not possible to do unless you take 
soil samples from areas within the areas that are growing poorly and to compare those with areas that uh, of good growth. Um, there are optimum times to sample and I'm going to talk about uh, uh, some of the timings that uh, are critical but at final harvest of a crop, let's just say you're going to renovate uh, your raspberry fields. It's then, particularly before the canes are destroyed, that you sample in there to determine what the nature of the pest population in the soil is. Um, in most cases, uh, management of nematodes uh, really needs to be considered as a pre-plant consideration. Uh, and the reason for that is because there are very few options available that can correct a problem once it develops in an established crop itself. Um, no way uh, to rescue the crop in the event that you fail to manage the crop prior to planting. Now, it's only been recently um, that DuPont and Dow have made a commitment to continue the, the uh, supplying Vitate, if you will. This happens to be a, a, another material that you uh, have available to you and raspberries uh, with the supplemental label, I might add. But even with this, this is not a standalone management tactic in Florida for management of nematodes. And I'll let others that are more knowledgeable about how to utilize uh, Vitate uh, discuss how, how you do that here. But by and large, at least in Florida, and I think in many instances, growers need to think of the use of these post-plant nematicides, if you will, as um, products that simply delay the inevitable, if you will. Uh, the inevitable being the arrival or recolonization of the bed from nematodes themselves. And in general, the old dogma is, is that all you need is 30 days of a reprieve, if you will, uh, to maintain nematodes from the plant to sustain uh, development, growth, and yield of the plant. So with that in mind, let me just tell you what the essential features of uh, an integrated season-long strategy for nematode management in Florida consist of. Um, there are summer here in the middle panel. Uh, I'm not quite sure the slide's properly designed, but if you look at the summer, these are off-season production practices here. Most growers in Florida utilize some kind of cover crop not only to contribute organic fractions to the soil because Florida sands are so devoid of organics, but to provide non-host crops to uh, nematodes such that they don't uh, allow them to proliferate. Sun hemp uh, is probably uh, the most widely used uh, cover crop in Florida. But this slide kind of depicts what constitutes a program for growers that have uh, nematode problems, long-term cropping histories with nematodes. So these are the very growers that are using the sun hemp as a cover crop. There are also the same growers that are utilizing broadcast soil fumigation with Telone 2 uh, during the summer in preparation for a fall um, fumigation with uh, a grower's choice. This is typically a, 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 for, a formulation of telone and chloropicrin. And then it, it concludes um, after the, the final harvest of a crop, in this case of strawberries, with uh, a treatment that's designed to kill the crop, kill the roots, and to kill nematodes that are captive in the bed itself. So in Florida systems, as many as three different fumigations can occur during the course of the season or the year in an annual cropping system to manage nematodes. Um, I also need to, to uh, indicate that there are other important features of nematode management systems in Florida that are also applicable to those here in Washington. And uh, to, to do this, I want to talk about the importance of weeds. Uh, in terms of nematode management. And this slide just depicts on the top panel here, black nightshade, redwood pickweed in the bottom right, and purslane, which is a succulent, uh, very perverse weed in Florida that uh, serve as very good host to um, root knot nematode. Um, 
In my career as an emetologist with the University of Florida, we have really maintained a, a, a list, a record of all the different weeds that we've collected and uh, characterized as hosts for root knot nematode. And I, I just want you to know that all of the key weed species in Florida are also serve as very good host for one species, race, or strain of root knot nematode. And that uh, weed management, therefore, becomes a, a very critical uh, element in the overall program. I took one of these weeds, and I want you to recognize how these different weeds, kids, also serve as host to a variety of different fungal and bacterial soil-borne uh, disease problems in the field itself. This just identifies the host status of black nightshade to various different and very important species of Phytophthora, Pythium, Rhizoctonia, Fusium, Fusarium, Verticillium. Uh, these are all very important soil-borne diseases in Florida. Uh, I want you to know that this isn't just uh, at the host status or just the competitive interaction between the weed and, and the plant. And this just illustrates some experiments that we conducted many years ago, actually, where we wanted to know what the impact of weeds that were growing in the row middles had in the overall scheme of things. So uh, the top panel just indicates uh, a herbicide treatment that's applied directly into the row middles themselves. Roundup was the choice. In this case, we installed ground cloths to serve as complete uh, non-chemical barriers to the, to the growth of weeds. And then in the bottom, we actually rotivated the middles in hopes of enhancing uh, weed growth in these middles. What did we conclude from all of the work that we've done is that you can't manage nematodes in Florida, and I will contend you can't do it here, unless you simultaneously consider weed management as, an, as another very important and effective tre overall treatment for nematode management. I'd also like to leave you with an idea here, a thought, that when you look at the population growth of a number of different nematodes in these middles, weedy middles right here, it's very easy to see that the population levels are triple those that occur within the bed. So it really doesn't matter what you do in the bed. The fumigant that you're using in the bed may exclude that, but the moment you remove the plastic and the drip tape, put a disc in that field and disc it all up, you've perpetuated the problem. And is it any wonder that we get on a treadmill thinking about how we need to use fumigants over and over and over again, it's because we allow nematodes to proliferate in areas where we should probably shouldn't be. So one of the reasons why we continue to use or have to use fumigants, particularly in Florida, derives from weeds themselves. I want to just set the stage for some of the things that are, some of the other things that I'm going to talk about. When we study fumigants in Florida, we need well, we utilize um, devices that are capable of characterizing the concentrations of different fumigants in soil air. We can't develop optim or optimize strategies for fumigant use unless we're able to, to portray which treatment is better than another. And in this case, we use photoionization detectors, MINRAY systems, if you will, and specialized probes that we've developed to characterize where fumigants go and where they don't go and what concentrations they're at, hopefully in devising a protocol that says now we can um, quantify concentrations times time to provide a level or an index of the mortality that we ought to be able to expect from the use of these fumigants. Uh, this is a very uh, important component, critical to the development of optimized fumigant use practices. I should also tell you that much of my work is done almost exclusively in grower fields. Um, Long-term commitments, uh, these are replicated large-scale trials. And it's uh, fortunate that, uh, well, if you have the, the appropriate equipment, it's very easy to integrate your work into the convoy or scheme of other things that are occurring in the field. 
But one of the things, particularly in strawberries, what you can't do is provide the harvest labor in which to characterize differences in yields that occur between treatments. Well, it's the yield to a grower that is the determining factor of what they're going to use, what, what they can afford to use, and it has to be reflected in the yields that are, are, occurred, are, are occurred. Well, uh, about 10 years ago, we started out looking at uh, remote sensing using hyperspectral reflectance, and uh, we would characterize canopy greenness, canopy size, using uh, the green seekers, if you will, uh, it beams two different wavelengths of lights down on the plant, collects the reflectance, calculates a, uh, an NDVI value for it, records it to a computer. And uh, from those measurements, I'm gonna show you in the next slide, we utilize those because they're calibrated, the NDVI measurements, canopy size is actually directly correlated with yield. So now we have a curve that we've calibrated for NDVI that relates yield in the field itself, which is what we need to characterize our, our uh, performance differences between treatments that we've looked at or looking at. I want to point out in the lower left hand uh, corner here um, is just a, an image of a drone. Uh, we're now integrating some uh, aerial observations, if you will, in hopes of looking at color indices, if you will, vegetation indices, to do the very same thing that we've done with these uh, ground-operated systems that we've used before. This slide, it's an actual slide here. I've worked a long time on developing al an alternative to methyl bromide for use in many of the uh, methyl bromide dependent crops in Florida. And this just illustrates uh, the differences that occur in the field with regard to the NDVI measurements that are collected and hopefully in this bottom panel that you see here down on the bottom. These white and red uh, dots, if you will, represent very small and stunted plants. So it's now the assessments that we make, uh, might be illustrated in the next slide here, no, uh, it, it's the, the summary, if you will, the sum of the values in these two different areas and then are compared afterwards are the ones that are determining how one, one treatment performs better or worse than another. And the reason why I needed to bring up the remote sensing part of it because a number of the slides that I'm going to show you uh, subsequent to this one involve these graphical illustrations of these NDVI values. And what I want to portray or, or to indicate in this slide is the value of destroying the crop immediately after harvest, final harvest. And um, there's three different ways we assessed uh, the performance of a treatment in which we applied VAPAM uh, delivered through the drip system over a relatively long injection period, three hours. And this is characterized, this, this red band, if you would, that you see across this, this panel right here, represents the area in which we did not apply the, the, the VAPAM itself. It was separated by an area that we did apply it, and then there was another area below it, and it's represented by this band right below it, uh, another area of stunted plants where we didn't. So there was a, a 30% increase in yield in the following crop following the application of APM uh, through the drip irrigation system as a crop termination tool. Does the treatment persist over the initial application? This is another example here in which we were observing uh, increases in yield associated with the, um, the in this case, using uh, Talon 2 as a crop termination tool two years after the application of it. And the curve that you see here is reflective of the um, correlation between NDVI and relative yield in this field. Was it the only field in which we saw uh, these increases in yield? No, uh, this is another example of a, of a field showing increases in yield uh, after uh, application itself. This slide just kind of characterizes overall what uh, I see as the benefits and importance of early crop destruction. 
I want you to, you should know that it's a, a founding tenet, if you will, of integrated strategies to manage nematodes. And integrated meaning an attempt to incrementally reduce populations uh, at, at multiple steps along the production pathway. It's easy to apply. Uh, you've got a captive audience of nematodes in the bed. You eliminate the food source. You eliminate the ability of the nematode to reproduce on those, that food source. And you, over, you reduce soil population overall. And you obviously can see benefits in the subsequent growth of the crop itself. I want to conclude by saying, if you, were, if you look at this bottom uh, right-hand side here, it's not a top-down approach, it's a bottoms-up approach. There are many growers that will utilize diquat, paraquat, or even Roundup in an attempt to kill the crop. It's a very slow process, and many crops in Florida are very unresponsive even to, to Roundup itself. Paraquat burns the foliage, doesn't necessarily kill the crop. So what we prefer is to see um, a, a drip delivery, if you will, since everybody in Florida utilizes a drip system of one kind or another. We prefer the bottoms up approach with a product that has little or no, has no resistance uh, to it at all and does a much better job than those that make uh, applications from above. Um, if you think about this idea that we're going to introduce a um, biocidal treatment of APAM or KPAM into the drip system, well, you really need to formulate the strategy that's going to direct growers on how to do that. And uh, what we have relied on very uh, extensively in the past is the utilization of water-soluble dyes that we put in the drip irrigation water. And in the process of doing that, if you, if you think about all of the variables in the bottom here that we have uh, attempted to examine different lengths of injection periods, different drip tapes, numbers of drip tapes per bed, differences in, in flow rates and emitter spacings, compaction, pulsing, use of adjuvants and, and things. It's been a very effective tool for us to characterize where water and the pesticides that are contained within them go. And what we do is we inject the dye for a specific treatment. We cut a cross-section across the bed and oftentimes even longitudinal to the bed. And we put a plastic um, panel in front of it that is gridded uh, on a one-inch basis. We put it down. We draw the outline of the bed. We draw the outline of the uh, movement of the blue dye, and we transfer this uh, these coordinates, if you will, to the computer, and we characterize what the wetting pattern looked like in the bed after we've made the treatment over the course of time. And this slide here is nothing more than to tell you that you, you can't make these products work without some kind of irrigation assistance, if you will. This slide just shows you two hours on and off of injecting the dye into it, not, and it just shows you the outward advancing waterfront uh, in dye stained areas. Well, the question becomes, how much assistance do you need to provide? How much water do you need to utilize to distribute it the, the, the pesticide in the irrigation water to maximize bed coverage. Well, we've got the, the calibrations, if you will, and these are depicted in these graphs right here, and you see they're asymptotic. They go flat at some point. It means that when it goes flat, it means you see no longer an increase in the wetting area, lateral expansion of the product, but the product is falling vertically out of the system. So right now, all of the recommendations that we make to growers in terms of injections for different things are based on volumes of water, in this case, per 100 linear feet, because Netafim and a lot of these other companies base their emissions 
on or drip emitter emissions based on per 100 linear feet or per, per emitter. So it's very important to, if you're going to consider the use of a, of a product like KPM or VAPM, to know how to make the application. I wanted to include this slide just to show you this was something that an observation that we made after a very long injection. If I'm not mistaken, this was a 12 hour injection here. And given that Florida uh, is the whole entire peninsula is composed of very fine sandy soils. The hydraulic conductivity in these soils are as much as 20 inches per hour. Things travel very fast and very vertically through these systems. But rather than moving vertically, it rather flooded the middles themselves than to penetrate or diffuse through a traffic pan that existed in these fields. We don't use subsurface tillage, if you will, deep tillage to any extent. And it told us immediately that these products don't diffuse or permeate through this traffic pan, which occurs at the deepest, at a, at a depth of the deepest tillage implement that's used in the field. If you've got a 16 inch disc, it's about eight inches at most below the soil surface because that's the deepest that that, that disc will do. That's as much depth distribution as you can get with that product. And it was this one that contributed to our, our uh, thoughts of, of looking at the impacts of the soil traffic pans in terms of fumigant diffusion. But where I wanted to, to, to conclude was here I'm coming from Florida. Uh, I know the soils are, are much heavier here. And if you really want to maximize or optimize uh, drip chemigation as a tool for managing soil-borne tests, pests, uh, you, you really need to develop more locally these diffusion pathways that I'm just trying to show you uh, uh, in these slides themselves. Um, I indicated that I've been involved over a long period of time in search of alternatives to methyl bromide in our production systems. And this slide just attempts to show that to replace methyl bromide didn't require a single product, a single chemical. It actually required an integrated chemical approach that coupled fumigants that have uh, activity, if you will, uh, against fungi. And if you look at this, uh, chloropicrin, for example, has none to pour uh, activity against nematodes or, or of weeds, but it's an excellent product for use against disease. Well, telone is similarly uh, defined. It's very good for nematodes, but isn't any good for anything else unless you couple them together. Um, so the, the systems that we've uh, worked on have our combinations of the above here. And once again, I, I, I want to reinforce this idea that the, the pest diversities and the geographic locations, like here in Washington, are not identical to that in Florida. So they require some kind of special attention or site-specific evaluation, if you, if you will. Now, I'm, I'm capable of providing some insights, I think, on that. But these are, these are recommendations that will have to be locally developed. But I can tell you that if you do want to use a fumigant, there are a number of very important components that need to be considered prior to irrigate or prior to applications. And I can't emphasize the importance of soil moisture and soil compaction, if you will, to sustaining the efficacy, the performance of the product, and to minimize or to prevent uh, emissions of these fumigants into the atmosphere. And these are the key, key considerations that are driving regulation in the use of soil fumigants overall. So um, in Florida, for example, we really can't even form a bed unless the water holding capacity is in excess of 100%. So water is very critical for us just in forming the, the bed itself. How do we go about it? Well, unlike uh, Washington, uh, I think, uh, all of the growers themselves are making their own applications of fumigants into their fields themselves. They utilize uh, 
either alone or in combination, the three features that I'm showing here. And we call it the three-way system. There's a Florida three-way, there's a Georgia three-way, but they all include telone, chloropicrin, and metam sodium or vapam and kpam in a way that provides nematode disease and weed control. Uh, the top left panel here is uh, the telone. It, it typically uh, is uh, described as a pre-bed application to the flat. It's uh, uh, applied at depth 10 to 12 inches of the flat. The false bed is made below, at which time chloropicrin, for example, is applied within the bed itself. And then prior to uh, installing the mulch, the plastic mulch, because everything in Florida is raised bed mulch based, is a mulch based system, if you will. So a, a shallow application to a depth of four inches is uh, made with vapam, and this is primarily or KPM for weed management. But even with these, this three-way approach, you would think that you'd be hammering everything in the soil. I mean, three different fumigants applied at, at or near their maximum rates, you'd think that would be plenty. But in reality, there is such inconsistency that we see in these applications and the performance of these products that we, you have to question why. Why does this happen? Well, if, if you... If you look at it closely, you determine that there are lots of causes or factors involved in the inconsistencies that we see. There are chemical um, characteristics of these fumigants. They don't have the same vapor pressure. They don't explode and move radially out from the points of application. No, they're very slow to volatilize. They're very... Uh, um, affected by soil moisture and water in the soil itself. It's just just the, the chemicals themselves, the physical nature of soils, biological, environmental, there's also human elements that we have to consider uh, in this process. Well, these two panels on the, on the left just illustrate some of the inconsistencies that we saw. The top panel on the left here is one in which it's a large scale trial. We're looking at uh, a number of different products here, and hopefully the red areas are, are, um, are clear enough to you to show that they, they failed and failed miserably in the control of sting nematode. This bottom panel here is a strawberry field that received three sequential treatments of different fumigants and still only picked about a third of what um, others did in the field. So when you look at when you think about the inconsistencies that we were seeing, we decided that what we needed were some new tools in which to study uh, the causes of this inconsistency. And what you see here are two different generations, if you will, of probinators. We call them probinators because they utilize the hydraulics of a tractor to push a hydraulic coring tool vertically into the soil, taking a four foot core out of the out of the soil. And what we use these cores for is to characterize the, the seasonal depth distribution of nematodes, uh, fumigant treatment impacts, and the inconsistencies where they go and where they don't go. And more importantly, we were thinking that what we were going to see and identify was the true origins, if you will, of nematodes that ultimately recolonize the bed from depth after treatment. Uh, this is just another uh, illustration here of the probinators in work. The panel on the left, if you will, is a crop termination treatment. You can see two green bands on either side here. Those were the untreated controls. We were looking not only at the distribution of soil gases within these cores at depth, but we were also recovering uh, different uh, intervals of soil in this to characterize where the nematode was at the time of this application. I'm going to summarize all of the work that we've done with regard to um, where nematodes occur in the soil profile. And I'll just um, tell you that unless there's a, an impermeable clay or spodic horizon, it's an impermeable layer, 
uh, within this soil profile, we always find there was never a field that we didn't find nematodes to the full depth of the core that we removed from the field itself. This was, these depths are well below the point at which these annual crops like tomatoes and peppers and strawberries grow. These nematodes are found in the absence of food resources. And if you think about with soil depth, at least in Florida, it becomes a microbial desert at the depths of these cores. It is just, there is nothing there other than the nematodes. Why that happens, I don't know. But more importantly, these are at depths that occur well below the depths at which we typically sample for nematodes. I don't know who's taking samples out here, but uh, you go out there, you're lucky if you take eight inches of soil from it, take a number of cores and composite it, and think that that, that sample represents what the true population threat is in that field. No, that's not true. But I, I will tell you that once you determine that the nematodes occur at depth, I guess the next question you need to know is, are they capable of upward migration? Well, I'll, I'll use some work that was generated here in, in, Wa in the state of Washington. Um, it's potato work. And uh, in this trial, uh, big PVC tubes were filled with sterilized soil. Uh, potatoes were planted in the top, nematodes were introduced at the bottom, and they determined after 22 days, root knot nematode, in this case it was chitwood eye, uh, was capable of moving upward over the course of a nine day period. That's two and a half inches a day. Well, for most people, uh, I, I can tell you that many people think that nematodes are pretty sloth like in the soil in terms of their movement. This is actually quite rapid. And in fact, if you look down in here, this study also placed nematodes at three, four, and five feet depths. And by the end of the season, where they made these inoculations, they could show that the nematodes that they introduced had colonized the bed and actually caused damage. So the answer to the, the question of whether they're capable of upward migration is absolutely true. Well, when you try to depict what it is we're finding here, we find nematodes. If you look on this, this left-hand side right here, nematodes are distributed throughout the entire four-foot profile. In our systems where, uh, the plant, where we plant into the bed, that typically defines the highest densities, but they do, with decreasing levels, uh, occur in, in much deeper soils. Where do fumigants go? Well, the fumigants don't penetrate through the traffic pan. Uh, I would have showed you that. It was a little bit more uh, complicated, but just trust me when I tell you that the traffic pan effectively blocks downward diffusion of everything but methyl bromide. Well, once you recognize that the traffic pan is pretty in, in, uh, important, uh, in terms of nematode management, well, now you have to devise a tactic in which to manage them. We label this tactic or management strategy as a vertical management zone approach. We define zone one as the bed, the raised bed, and we define zone two as the area below the traffic pan itself. Now, the what's required to implement a vertical management zone is some new application equipment and I'm very thankful for Dow AgroSciences and John Russo, who's uh, an ag engineer in, in Florida. He helped us put together uh, a system here, a singular system, if you will. The, the panel on the right here is a deep shank uh, unit, uh, injects fumigants via the wings here in two streams that we put directly below the middle of the bed itself. These are resettable shanks. In the event that you hit a, an old stump or buried Volkswagen or whatever it is, we can, uh, it'll reset by itself. Uh, we were also kind of concerned that we might not be able to distribute the fumigant in a way that would address nematodes at these depths. So what this ag engineer did on the second panel here is divine, to design a shoe that we put, uh, we covered the shank, removed the wings, put the shoes on, and it had allowed us to install a subsurface drip system that we could 
after very long injections ensured that these products were getting at the depths that we were observing nematodes to occur at. One way or another, we were going to take no prisoners, either with a shank applied product or with a drip applied product utilizing this new system. This just kind of illustrates the the hard work, I guess, uh, that would be required to install a permanent subsurface manifold system for drip applied fumigants. You got to you got to install the the in this case it was drip tape. We're now utilizing the the rigid uh, tapes themselves uh, using that, and then you got to dig the the manifold uh, trench, and you got to connect these individual lines. There's a lot of work involved in it. I'm not going to talk a lot about it. This work is kind of in its infancy. But overall, the protocol are, is the deep shank is put out pre-bed, just like I was talking before. The grower is following me shortly there behind me. He's installing or injecting the uh, material into the bed. We typically double press these beds because it is the compaction of the bed that allows for increased retention in the soil. And we then cover it with different kinds of plastics from your low density plastics all the way to the, the vapor safe, totally impermeable uh, films themselves. And, um, I, oh, um, I need to say something about the sealing, if you will, because sealing fumigants are very important. Uh, think about the panel right here where you've got a shank trace out there. Where does the fumigant want to go? It wants to follow a path of least resistance. It wants to come right back up that shank trace. And unless you cover it with something or you seal that surface itself, you're going to limit the activity, the efficacy of that product. Well, we're fortunate that in this system, we've put a very compacted bed right over the top of the shank trace. It's disturbed to a depth of about eight inches, but we put a very compact bed. We've already got a gas in the bed that it's, this other fumigant below is competing with to get at. And then we cover it with an impermeable plastic. So we've really effectively uh, uh, provided a very effective seal for the fumigant. In other types of broadcast application here, this is just a typical chisel plow here, if you will, and a lot of growers will simply roll the, uh, the field after the application is made. Uh, I want to just illustrate using these MinRay systems, these photoionization detectors here, if you will, that I want you to notice what happens in the event if you don't seal the soil properly. Now, these two, this graph right here has two curves on it. One of them is midway between the, the shanks themselves, and the one with the peak concentrations right here are uh, measurements that were taken within the shank trace. Well, I will tell you that this application was ineffective because all of it came up through the shank trace, and very little of it diffused even midway uh, between the shanks themselves. And it was very easy to document uh, this in the field. We put it out, we rolled it, we came back in, we measured it, and after it was all gone, we came out with a shovel. And I wanna show you that about two or three inches below the level of the surface, you can still see the residue of the, the opening of the shank itself as it moved through the soil itself. This is, uh, this is something that needs to be corrected if you're going to improve the performance of it. I want to just spend uh, two slides here, if you will, of what this deep shank treatment prior to the grower making his own grower treatment into the bed, into the, physically into the bed. I need to tell you that in strawberries, every 10th row houses a sprinkler row. A sprinkler row. Overhead sprinklers. It's used for freeze protection. We ice plants on cold nights to protect them afterwards. This is a row that you cannot make deep shank applications to 
unless you want to repair or replace the irrigation. So there's an untreated control, if you will, every 10th row in this field. This row that you're looking at here represents the grower standard, which was Dominus. And I think it's pretty obvious why I'm not a particularly big fan of Dominus as a, a soil fumigant. But in this field here, there was a 29% increase in yield associated with the, the uh, treatment itself. Uh, five minutes. That's all I need. Um, this is another trial last year. We saw a 44% increase associated just with this deep shank treatment and an additional 20% when we put a fumigant into the bed. Um, I'll conclude with uh, this slide right here just to document the importance of deep shanking uh, nematicidal products and telone to address uh, nematodes. This was a grower who called me up and said, hey, Joe, you got to come out here and look at this. And uh, it needs a little bit of description here. But this, what you're looking at is a summer broadcast treatment of telone that was made into this field. The application of telone as the broadcast treatment was made perpendicular to the, the direction of the rows here, which was composed of Pictor 60. I would defy anybody in this crowd to tell me what the value of the Pictor 80 treatment was in this bed because if you didn't put telone out there as a broadcast treatment, everything died. It effectively tells you that the problem isn't in the bed. The problem occurs below the level of the bed itself. And if you think about what, at least in our hot summers, uh, that the soil is being tilled and things, there really isn't very many nematodes uh, in the surface soil horizons. They all, all occur deeper in the soil. Uh, these are the typical features that are associated with the use of these. Uh, yes, the, the system is really gaining traction in Florida. This uh, slide here just depicts, and it looks like it's difficult to see anyway, but all the variants and variations that growers are making and developing their own systems in which to apply these. What I want to conclude with is this is a system that is capable of working in the temporal, temperate rainforest uh, in heavy soils under cold, rainy conditions. Uh, the answer is probably no unless uh, the treatment is timed properly. Uh, I, I want to indicate that uh, sampling is also a requirement. I mean, you need to first determine whether this is a product, uh, a treatment that is uh, deemed necessary based on the, the samplings that you have. I want you to recognize that nematodes occur in deeper soil profiles and you need to recognize that third dimension. It's not a surface eight inch phenomenon. It's where they're occurring elsewhere and sampling at the ends of, of a crop when you're getting ready to, to renovate it and uh, the field is very important. Do nematodes like lesion and, and dagger nematode, which are some of the, the predominant species here in Florida, occur at depth? Well, hell yes, they do. These, this is some work. They don't occur in, in Washington, but they occur in, uh, in this case in South Australia, and I just want you to be aware that yes, they do occur at depths uh, in the soil itself. They are seasonally expressed, population levels go up and down, and they're well uh, distributed with depth both in and outside of the row. This was another study that showed that they aren't just distributed in the row itself, in the plant row, but they're also in the drive rows, the middles if you would, that, that indicates or suggests that weeds play a very important role in the, the numbers and development of these nematodes there. Uh, finally, one last slide here. This is depth distribution of dagger. It just shows in this particular study that the highest densities were occurring at levels well below the levels that are typically sampled. So you, you have to ask yourself whether chemical control strategies for this pest, are they not limited right from the get-go, particularly within a heavier soil? I would contend that they probably are. Uh, we have a similar um, 
nature of problems. There are disease organisms, there are nematodes, and there are weeds themselves that form the basis of why you would want to fumigate. I am not picking on anybody, but I couldn't help when I looked at this particular side uh, that the standing water and the heavy soils and the proximity of people in this field are, are uh, let's just say, things that should be considered uh, in terms of their application. I would contend that the more appropriate conditions are similar to those that occur here. Now, I don't know the degree to which these are, are possible, but I did go to some extent to determine when that might be suitable for here in Washington here, and I'm thankful that uh, there is a weather station here in Linden that allowed me to characterize the distribution of rainfall and temperature, and when you come, couple those two together, you see that the harvest is occurring here June and July, and the sooner that the renovation process begins after final harvest here, the crop termination treatment is appropriate, and then anything soil fumigation-wise needs to occur before these colder rains uh, appear in uh, October and in November. Um, I think I'm kind of done, uh, other than to say is, uh, I think what's required here in, is what I see is that these advances come with some, some hard work, uh, some understandings of what the barriers to uh, fumigant movement, persistence, and crossbed movements that are occurring in these heavier soils. I, I wanted uh, also to, to realize that in Florida anyway, there are roots that are coming, emanating from the crop that's in the bed that are in search of additional water and nutrients. And these are the very roots themselves that are making contacts with pathogens that are occurring in the middle. And those have an incredible impact on the success of any treatment. I think new approaches and precision placements are going to contribute to enhanced efficacy and increased performance in uh, raspberry. And with that, I don't know how many minutes I have for questions. I'd be more than happy to entertain them. I'm also going to be around this morning and be more than happy to talk to anybody that uh, would want to talk to me about that. So, hey, with that, let me, let me thank you. And some comments. I mean, I've been in this business for a long time, but I, uh, and, and, and noticing we did some uh, testing of tarping in, in row tarping. And, and uh, we use quite a bit of, of separated manure, uh, uh, so that we, we got a lot of dairy farms close to us, we can get a good source of that. Is it, but when we pulled the tarp off, underneath it, it kind of surprised me, but underneath it, they, they love that, that separated manure for the, for the mice to co come in there. They, they, it was just uh, loaded in uh, under the what tarp. What came in, the mites? Mice. Oh. Uh, and then another thing was, is it, uh, 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 Trident does most of our our uh, so uh, 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 fumigation, and we, and our berries are in for a long time, and so so we don't even test for nematodes. We really just go in because it, it's probably 30 years of, of the crop being in the ground. Uh, but anyway, uh, uh, I went and uh, after he, he takes and and uh, shanks it and and uh, uh, light rolls it, but we triple roll it. Uh, in all different directions, and so it's really sealed. And and uh, and then, like in February, we'll open it up. And in, even in February, I could smell. But the, the, they're discounting what I'm going to say. But uh, I, you could smell the gas coming out. And he said, "No, that's that's just a byproduct uh, of it because you you won't you won't you won't really smell it." But then, my some of my questions are. Is it uh, say here in in in, in uh, uh, Whatcom County uh, that does that the rain and the moisture uh, help take that gas down even further or or as we got it sealed to go and end up holding it into that lower level uh, uh, so that 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 uh, <coughs> whether it's in trapped longer or, or does the rain some of the rain take it down or all that gas has to come up yeah, yeah. I, 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 there are lots of questions in there uh, let me tell you that's not a singular question I'm fully aware of uh, fumigating in the fall because you can't get in in the spring that's 
principally what they do in potatoes. But I will tell you uh, very clearly that once you put talon in the mud, it stays in the mud. And it has to drain properly to reform airspace in there for it to volatilize into a gas. Now, I will tell you that uh, one of the other issues associated with the use of talon is the hydrolytic de decay. It decays or degrades. Degrades is the word in water. So you limit, you limit not only the diffusive spread of it, but you limit the, diff the persistence of the compound that you want to migrate through the soil. There are reasons why you don't want to put talon into wet soils. It will, it will be there in the spring. Uh, it will be there months afterwards in Florida, where soil temperatures are never below 60 degrees, for example. But if it's in the water, it has no place to go. Uh, I will tell you that triple rolling it is not the solution to sealing, soil sealing because it only compresses so much of the, the shank trace itself. It's defined as inches. What I was trying to illustrate there was, yes, we only rolled it once, okay? That's totally insufficient. You can take a shovel out there and characterize every place in which the product was delivered because you can find the remnant shank trace in it. Uh, a better solution to that is to disc it and then to roll it. We disc, then we roll, and in our systems with the, the overheads, we'll even apply a surface water seal on it just to improve uh, persistence containment, if you will. Containment is very important. Daryl, use the mic if you're gonna ask a question. Yeah. Use, yeah, a question? use the mic. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll repeat the question. Okay, but anyway, now I got it. Uh, that now, uh, my roller is a, is a crow shank, uh, so it's got, it kind of got, got knife blades on it, uh, uh, so, so it kind of helps uh, uh, cut into that, that, that uh, and, and because we're going different directions, uh, uh, but I, only one year out of, out of probably 15, did I uh, uh, not sp uh, smell the, the gas coming out after I opened it up with a field cultivator? Yeah, well, that's well, that's good. That's a that's a sign that either the well, it's a sign that it's not volatilizing fast. And if the situation is the soils are cooler at depth, it isn't going to happen. It's going to be prolonged over a period of time to begin with. Uh, uh. I'm going to ask a question. Very good, very good. I was just curious, how deep are you deep applying the vapam or the chloropicrin? Like how deep when you're deep shanking or doing the drip application? Uh, no, no, no. Um, let me just tell you, when you look at the distribution of fungal pathogens themselves, they are not found at depth. They are actually, unless you're using a turn plow or something where you're inverting soil, then you can find them that depth. No, they don't uh, uh, occur at depths as a result. We put it in at 8 to 10 inches uh, deep, the chloropicrin. Uh, the telone is the product that is actually applied deep shank uh, and just the telone. How deeply, though? Like how? Oh, oh, well, talon is uh, applied 16 to 20 inches deep. And when you characterize where it goes, uh, it goes everywhere. It moves radially from the point of emission in the bed, and it will go up. It leaves a soil surface there that's relatively untreated. But uh, we're hoping that what happens there is, because we're using plastics themselves, we're containing fumigants in the bed for a longer period of time. We don't see issues with uh, any failure to manage nematodes in the bed itself. Thanks, Joe. Our next, our next speaker is...